Walt, please, let's stop asking viewers for money and just roll the video. Who do you think you're talking to? I have feeble selling points like creator commentaries and early access to feature videos for VIPs to get out. YouTubers all over the world churning out content out of the goodness of their hearts and you think that of me? No. I am the one who shills. On November the 26th of 2016, sometime around noon, Lisa Guy walked into her local Walmart in Knoxville, Tennessee to purchase some groceries. It was standard household items all around. Hair and cleaning products, pet food, a handsome amount of chicken, bacon and ribs, plus a few cases of beer that were bound to come in handy for the approaching holiday season. Though none of these items would ever wind up making it to a fridge, because Lisa's grocery run would have been unremarkable in every way, but for the fact that it was done at the behest of her useless toad of a son. At least that seems to be the natural inference in light of the fact that Joel Michael Guy Jr. had planned on Lisa making the trip around this time several days in advance. According to writings found scribbled in a notebook and handwriting illustrative of a child with severe arrested development. And that really was Joel Michael in a nutshell. 28 years old at the time, he'd never been formally diagnosed with any mental illness or intellectual impairment. At one point in his teens, he'd even attended a high school for exceptional students. Whatever it is that's wrong with Joel Michael can't be captured by grades on a report card or seemingly by a psychological assessment. Some kids just come out wrong. And the problem isn't that no one can see it. The pervasive strangeness that seemed to seep through Joel Michael's pores was impossible to not notice. He never had any friends, barring one exception from high school, and seemed to fully embrace that loner status, reportedly making no attempt to ever form a connection with any of his family members, including his three half-sisters, and now pushing 30, had still never worked a day in his life. But that wasn't to say he was still living with his parents. Oh no, he was just visiting at the time he had his mom pop out for groceries. For his day-to-day, -day, he shared an apartment in Baton Rouge, Louisiana with that one friend he had from high school. His half of the rent, as well as all of his other living expenses, were covered by, you guessed it, none other than Lisa Guy. By all accounts, the only reason Lisa even worked a job anymore was so she could hand her paychecks to Joel Michael. But soon this was about to change. With his father Joel Sr. now in his 60s, and Lisa through the better part of her 50s, they had decided the time had come to retire. And once they stopped working, naturally it would be time for Joel Michael to finally start. Joel Michael had other plans, however. Which is why after departing that Walmart, no one besides Joel Michael would see Lisa Guy or Joel Sr. alive. Ever again. And it didn't take very long for people to notice their absence. Hi, yes, I have an employee that um, has not reported for work today, and highly unlike her. I've tried calling her home number, I've tried calling her cell phone, and can't get a hold of her. What can we do about that? Can somebody go by and check on them? Yeah, do you know her address? It is 11434 Golden. View Lane. And what is your name, ma'am? My name is Jennifer Whited. And what company are you with? Jacobs Engineering. And what's the employee's name? Lisa Guy. Her husband's name is Joel. And they do have a, a dog named Jake. I think he's a big baby. And I know that their house is for sale and they are moving and she is leaving our company. But that's supposed to be Friday, and this definitely isn't like her just not to show up. Okay. Uh, I'll send a call over to officers, have them swing by and check on her. And if anything changes before then, just give us a call back here, okay? Okay, great. Right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Countless welfare checks are conducted every day across the United States, and just about all of them amount to what you would call false alarms. When Detective Jeremy McCord arrived at Golden View Lane on November 28th, however, the signs that something was amiss would only continue to mount over time. 
Upon my arrival, there were vehicles in the driveway. With the vehicles in the driveway and the information that we had, it was obvious that the owners of the vehicles uh, could possibly be inside the residence and need assistance. I actually jumped the fence, uh, went to the back with another officer, uh, got down and um, got up on the door, observed that there was a doorknob missing on the back door and uh, the glass was, was warm. Overall, there was there was something in emanating from that door to the point where I felt heat and I also smelled an odor that was chemical in nature um, and I'm not certain exactly what specifically that odor was. It was just odd to me. Went back around the fence and a uh, garage door opener was located. The garage door was opened. As soon as the garage door was opened, uh, you could feel heat and then we went in and went to the door that led from the garage into the residence. Upon walking inside, you know, immediately being hit with odor and uh, uh, heat, uh, very extreme heat. Right there, you've got on the table, you've got what appears to be a, a purse, a couple wallets um, that, that are out. I believe there was a hammer uh, on the table. You could see that there were groceries uh, inside the residence. There were three cases of beer, perishables. There was breakfast meat stuff like that in bags that you you could just see sitting there and it, it's it's odd i mean there's just uh, there's stuff in the middle of the floor to, at an entryway so you're wondering if somebody's had a medical event after they've carried in groceries you know we just don't know we're feeling the heat the stove's on the oven's on there is a pot on the stove the uh, contents of the pot um it was um it was determined that there was a, a head uh, a severed head in the pot. Then immediately to the right is a formal dining room that had a, a large amount of uh, long guns laying there. There's nothing downstairs that I'm observing that that makes sense to me. You know what I'm saying? I mean, we're, we go through houses and we clear houses regularly, and most of the time, if you if you encounter something, you kind of know right when you get in. This was a, a very different situation because once we get upstairs, it's like the world does a 180. Everything gets turned upside down. But once you come up the first set of steps you're able to go up like three steps and you can see down the hallway there's reddish brown staining that's consistent with with blood staining that i've observed at other crime scenes would appear to be blood on the wall um, and then i was able to see down the hall and see what was uh, also what was directly in front of me and uh, i saw hands uh, not connected to a body and at that point, the other officers held the hallway and we started doing standard building clearing. But I made the decision to turn and go into what eventually I'd learned is the master bed. Okay. When you go in, there was, there was like plastic drop cloth type material or something. It would roll of plastic on, on the bed. And I remember the bed was made. There were items scattered on the floor in a, in a general area to, your, to my left. And I went straight to what I would have been my next threat area at this point, which would have been the, the bathroom. And uh, the only thing I saw were two tubs with what appeared to be uh, uh, body parts liquefying. liquefying. I'll never get those smells out of my head or my dreams. Did you have occasion to uh, notice any sort of knives present in that bathroom? There were knives, yes. Uh, during this time, there's a dog that's barking, and the dog will bark and bark and bark, and then the dog stops barking. That was odd to me. Most dogs, when they bark and you're in their territory, they continue barking. This dog was stopping. He was he was kind of whimpering at times. And if you could describe um, the dog's behavior when you took possession of him, he, he was tired. Uh, I, I'm not been around that dog. I don't know the dog normally, but it was. It, I mean, he was thirsty. There was no water in there or anything. I mean, um, and, and he would be ha be up and barking, and then he would just stop. It was just. Whatever monster did this, the most you could ever say about their character was at least they spared the family dog. 
Though truth be told, there was never any real mystery around the identity of the culprit, as the list of people who could have reasonably had access to Lisa and Joel Guy Sr. during the window of time they would have met their fates quickly narrowed to one. And who else was staying in the house? It, uh, it was Joel Michael Jr. Okay. Um, they had said that they um, were retiring and that they were moving to Sigourneville and that um, Joel Michael was going to uh, find a job or need to find a job because they were no longer their money when they sat down and d determined <laughs> even down to the amount of beer that they drink a week and the amount of cigarettes that they have a week um, what amount of money they would need and that amount of money was what they had to retire the typical time with dad and Lisa was more laughing and banter but if Joel Michael Jr. was there he wasn't ever hanging with us doing that banter. He would be in his room. Thanksgiving was completely different. The moment that I um, arrived, Joel Michael Jr. was um, talking to us. And so, and he had never, I I'm not sure Joel Michael Jr. knew my kids' names. And so um, it, for him to t talk to them was, was odd. And so he was talking to my kids and he was, bringing them upstairs they had lisa had kept every single thing that this kid had that i mean he wasn't a kid at that point but his entire everything beanie babies that he had collected they were bringing those boxes down but it wasn't lisa giving that away lisa wouldn't lisa didn't want to give it away um it was joel michael giving joel michael jr giving it to my boys which was still odd every time i would go upstairs it's like he would be right behind me, which is also... When you say he, who do you mean? I'm so sorry. Joel Michael would be... Joel Michael Jr. would be right behind me. Um, like in my... Like like right behind me. Because I remember doing this. Like, why is he right behind me? Okay. And uh, did you find that odd at the time? I did because on, for 27 years, or however old he was, he stayed in his bedroom. He was never smiling saying, let me give you something, or right behind me, ever. Can you tell the jury a little bit about how you found out about your parents' deaths? I don't know the exact time, but about two. Um, Jennifer had got in touch with me through Facebook. Jennifer Whited? Yes, ma'am. And she had said, there's something wrong, you need to call me, or, or and I'm not sure her exact message. And so I called her and she said, you need to get a hold of the detectives. And so I called um, Detective McCord and he said, you need to come meet me. He said, do not go to the house. And I said, okay. And he said, meet me at the Harley Davidson place. And I met him at the Harley Davidson um, parking lot. Did you tell him who had been present with you on Thanksgiving? Yes, ma'am. Did you give him information about the defendant, about what? your brother? What being kind? present at, on Thanksgiving. Oh, yes, last time you saw your parents was on Thanksgiving, and the last time you saw your brother, Joel Michael Jr., was on Thanksgiving. Yes, ma'am. Is he in the courtroom today? Yes, ma'am. Can you point to him for the jury? In some, you're saying Joel Michael was more outgoing and friendly that Thanksgiving than you'd seen him before? It's not more he, he was outgoing and friendly. He usually is never outgoing and friendly. Okay. He doesn't speak at all. So in summation, an extremely grisly and obviously extremely premeditated murder scene is discovered in the home of Joel and Lisa Guy. The only other person who is known to be residing at the residence is nowhere to be found, and is reported by his own family members to have been acting extremely out of character right before all of this would have come to be. Very strong circumstantial evidence so far, you'll surely agree. But this is where we get to the truly exceptional element of this crime. Because while the case against Joel Michael was always a slam dunk, and very likely would have been no matter what occurred after he made the decision to put his poorly conceived plan in motion, there was one thing he did that seems like it was almost designed to eliminate any doubt one could have as to his culpability in the event any sort of ambiguity was left on the table. He wrote his poorly conceived plan down. Now obviously Joel Michael would have intended on destroying the notebook he left behind in a maroon backpack that was recovered from his bedroom. Still though, 
the contents of Joel Michael's macabre to-do list is so jaw-droppingly explicit, not just in outlining his plans, but the sinister intentions behind them, that it warrants going through line by line, lest you would have think this video might be exaggerating for effect. Get killing knives, the note begins, starting things off with a bang. Note Joel Michael seems to have gone back and added the word killing as it scrawled above knives, suggesting he first wrote simply get knives in the document meant only for his eyes, but then felt the need to add that amendment as if he might forget what the purpose of the weapon was. Quiet. Multiple, he adds. Then to the right, he adds the bullet point, get carving knives to make small pieces. Again, feeling the need to disclose the purpose of the items. It'll turn out to be a bit of a theme. Get sledgehammer. Crush bones. See? Bring blender and food grinder. Grind meat. Well, at least he didn't say human meat. Get bleach. Denature proteins. This is a reference to breaking down the bodies. Just as a quick sort of PSA on that front, although this channel doesn't have any expertise in body liquefaction, we can say it's extremely hard to accomplish with everyday over-the-counter items to say the least, as Joel Michael would discover. Not a good idea, even outside the immorality of it all. Get plastic bin for denaturation process. This part didn't really go according to plan either. The bins in which his parents' bodies were dissolving were beginning to show serious give at the sides by the time officers arrived. Does not matter where they're killed. Within the house, he means. He added an addendum to that point, but then scribbled it out. Just get rid of bloody spots to prevent evidence of time of death, not the mattress or couches. Didn't go according to plan. Joel Sr. put up a struggle in the exercise room that left far more blood on the carpet than Joel Michael would have had any hope of getting out. Get rid of bodies inside house, there and my DNA already there. Meaning whatever drawbacks there are in killing his parents in the same place he's known to be staying, at least his presence at the murder scene isn't going to be suspect in and of itself. Cleverest thing he's said so far, though it's sort of damning with faint praise. Flush chunks down toilet, not garbage disposal. He never got this far into the plan. Get plastic sheeting for disposal process. Get hollow point bullets just in case. He then crossed that out and added the following correction note. Will be seen buying bullets. Just use computer room gun. Check to make sure there are bullets. Last resort. Joel Michael was actually seen buying just about every item he used or intended to use while undertaking his wicked plan. He used cash in every transaction, yet still felt the need to hold on to the receipts, so the state still had a paper trail they could use to piece together every single step he made getting things together in the days leading up to the murders. He even made use of one of those receipts, purchasing a knife from Academy Sports on November 18th, and then exchanging it on the 19th after it proved to not be up to standard for reasons unknown. Next up is one of the most remarkable notes in the entire document. He's not alive to claim her half of the insurance money. All mine. Five hundred thousand dollars. This one would barely sound more dastardly if he had added mwahahaha at the end of it. And it's also possibly the most glaring example of that on-running theme we talked about of Joel Michael's tendency to write down the motivations behind his plans. It's not as if he was ever going to forget the reason why he was committing one of the most horrifying crimes Tennessee has seen in recent memory. It's almost as if it's there just in case someone were liable to make the mistake of attributing his actions to mental illness, or just anything less shallow and despicable than pure financial gain. Flood the house. Covers up forensic evidence. Didn't get that far in the plan. Turn heater up as high as it goes. Speeds decomposition. Did get that far in the plan. The aircon and several heaters were all working to make the house feel like an oven, hence the extreme heat you heard Detective McCord describe. Bleach reacts with luminol just like blood. Douse area with bleach. This is actually true. Both blood and bleach, as well as other oxidizing agents, will cause luminol to light up when it comes into contact with them. Obviously, though, authorities arrived on scene well before measures like luminol testing would be necessary to detect the presence of blood. Didn't get that far in the plan. Big sprayer. Lie. Trash compactor? Then his handwriting starts going up in size dramatically as if he's getting excited. Body gives time of death. Alibi. It's sort of hard to discern what he means by that. 
If the measures Joel Michael took to obscure natural post-mortem processes successfully made his parents' time of death inconclusive, that would be one thing. But it would hardly give him an alibi. To do that, he'd need to somehow make it appear as if they were killed during a specific window of time where he could be placed elsewhere. Nothing in his plans or actions can be said to achieve those ends even theoretically. Don't have to get rid of body if there is no forensic evidence on the body. Perhaps he was hoping to potentially avoid the messy liquefaction part of his plan if the slayings went perfectly. No such luck, of course. Handwriting gets really big again. His fingerprints and DNA. Well, this one requires a little bit of speculation because Joel Michael didn't spell out his meaning. Perhaps he's learning. It's been discerned that part of Joel Michael's plan was to frame his father for a murder-suicide, robbing him not just of the rest of his life, but the reputation that he left behind. This note then is likely a reference to that part of the plan, and also speaks to why Joel Sr.'s hands were severed. It would have just been the simplest way for Joel Michael to put his father's prints where he wanted them. On to page two. Minimize things I touch throughout visit. Wear gloves and socks to prevent fingerprints and footprints. Drop something down the garbage disposal to break it. Get him on the ground fixing it. Kill him with the knife. Obviously spelling out the plan with Joel Sr. here, and yet again you have to scratch your head over what the point of doing so was. It's not as if it's a complex scheme. In any event, things didn't wind up going down that way. Perhaps because Joel Michael was running low on time. Joel Sr.'s assault by all appearances began and ended in the exercise room. Clean up mess from him before she gets home. Did not go according to plan. The next note gets messy. Kill her with knife. Kill dog after. So much for that saving grace, but then he crosses that out and writes above. Leave alive. Then an illegible word or two. Take dog with you something him with him? How exactly Jake the dog factored into the final plan remains a mystery. Place her in shower with dog. Then he crossed out with dog after deciding Jake would be left alive for whatever reason. Turn on hot water and point at her to get rid of forensics. By which he means get rid of physical evidence, of course. Forensics is a scientific process, not a physical object itself, but now we're probably getting a bit pedantic. Remove her clothes and take them with me for disposal. Place him in plastic bin and use it to get him into the upstairs bathroom. Cut off his arm and plant his flesh under her fingernails. Place her hand with his DNA so that his DNA is not washed away by shower. All of this went completely out the window after Joel Sr. derailed Joel Michael's plans by putting up a fight. No one was found in a shower, and Joel Michael had clearly decided on destroying both of his parents' bodies in the plastic tubs. Use sodium hydroxide to destroy his soft tissue and soften bones for transport, based every hour to accelerate. Flush sodium hydroxide down the toilet. Wash out bin with handheld shower head and then direct handheld into toilet to flush everything out of the pipes and into the public waterway. Like so much of Joel Michael's plan, this all seems extremely optimistic in the sense that you'd think when flushing a liquefied human body down a toilet, something suspect would still be detectable in the toilet or the piping or what have you afterward. Perhaps he calculated no one would be thinking to look in those places once his plan was complete. We'll get to that part soon. Douse killing room, z kitchen, with bleach. It's the little qualifying touches like adding an S in parenthesis to room that really top this note off. Place her curler with flammable paper and flammable containers of gasoline in four locations. His killing room, her killing room, his bathroom, her bathroom. This is where a lot of the overall clumsiness of Joel Michael's actions, up to the point the scene was discovered, starts to make more sense, for lack of a better word. It's not that he thought his tracks would be sufficiently covered after the bodies were flushed down the toilet. Everything up to this point was a sort of precautionary measure before he burned the house down. Just to be crystal clear in case this was necessary for anyone, this is not to say that suddenly makes his plan smart by any stretch of the imagination. If the guy house had suddenly burst into flames with Joel Michael safe and sound in Baton Rouge and any charred remains of his parents conspicuously absent from the rubble, people would still have had plenty of questions. Wipe down areas near killing rooms and bathrooms. Turn heaters up to 90 degrees to melt fingerprints and dry everything. And this next one's another doozy. Set her phone to send me a text message late Sunday to prove that I was in Baton Rouge and she was... alive.
Imagine writing a note this sinister and feeling the need to put quotation marks around alive, almost like a little wink to yourself. This channel has covered a lot of really shitty people, and there comes a point where it's sort of bad taste to try and rank evil. But in terms of an individual whose nastiness seems to seep through in everything that they do, right down to their pen strokes, he really is something else. Leave through front door and wipe down doorknobs. Timer for flammable set for Friday at 10am. Sunlight masks fire, but not smoke. Everyone at work so they can't report it. That last part so silly you might find yourself re-reading it because you can't believe it's the author's actual logic. A full-blown house fire in broad daylight is reliably going to be noticed and reported by someone in or passing through the neighbourhood pretty damn quickly. Marginally slower than if it were outside standard business hours perhaps, but very unlikely a game changer. Also worth noting, Joel Michael must have had to change his planned day for the murders. They wound up taking place on Saturday the 26th, so unless his original intention was to hang around like a bad smell for a full week, he probably initially planned on killing his parents after the rest of the family had departed on Thanksgiving, Thursday the 24th, with everything set and ready to burn by the following Friday morning. A hopelessly tight window of time. As evidenced by the fact that when he did eventually commit the crime on the 26th, a full 48 hours later the crime scene was still an absolute mess and Joel Michael was running around like a chicken with its head cut off elsewhere when police broached the house. Almost done with the note now. Page 3 consists solely of the following. Ultraviolet light shows fingerprints. Check mail before leaving. Okay. To get rid of blood, use peroxide, hemoglobin, and bleach, DNA. Sciencey stuff, sort of already covered. Page 4 is also sciencey stuff, no need to itemize it really. It's just his estimates of the biological makeup of the bodies he has to find the appropriate chemicals to chew through, it's all very unpleasant. Then finally there's page 5, where we get down to business, with Joel Michael breaking down his parents' various assets and how much he's likely to inherit. As with the All My note from earlier, it often reads as if Joel Michael's primary intent is to appear as wicked and selfish as humanly possible. For instance, her life insurance, $500,000, possibly more with double indemnity. With him missing slash dead, I get the whole thing. Beyond that, it's just various versions of the same sort of thing, though it is noteworthy and thoroughly depressing that beyond his mother's life insurance, Joel Michael himself seems to calculate that his winnings from all of this may well be pretty limited. He acknowledges that the distribution of Lisa's assets are unknown to him. On Joel Sr.'s side, he'll have his half-sisters and other family to contend with. Some of his assets aren't paid off and the damage incurred by the fire will put a further dent in what's left. Looking it all over, we wouldn't be surprised if Joel Michael was lucky to have 600k coming to him once all was said and done. Now 600k is a lot of money in a lot of contexts, you'd certainly be happy to see it fall out of a tree. For a 28 year old with no income though, it ain't set for life money. You'll still have to get a job one day, in the very unlikely event you're ever in a position to apply for one. Which brings us to another sort of PSA we wanted to issue in reaching this final page before moving on to what happened next. When you see a video like this discussing a person who killed their parents for a payday and all the ways in which they did not come close to getting away with it, that is absolutely not to be taken as some sort of reverse instructional for how you could kill your parents for a payday and successfully get away with it. Because beyond the fact that killing your parents for a payday is just an absolutely abhorrent thing to do, the real headline here is that you're not going to get away with it. Killing your parents for a payday is a brazen crime, and once you set the wheels in motion, there will be innumerable things liable to go wrong no matter how thoroughly you believe you've planned ahead. Not to mention you're already set up as the default prime suspect, which is a terrible position to be in when you've got your hands dirty. So. In the event you were to make the horrible, stupid decision to put yourself in that terrible position, until such an unlikely time as you are in the clear, you shouldn't spend any mental energy doing the math on what your takings are going to come out to. Because if you get caught, which you just about certainly will, it's going to be zero dollars. So seriously, 
you don't need to think about it. And you certainly don't need to write it down. So with the horror house breached and law enforcement continuing to descend upon it, one big question left was, where the hell was Joel Guy Jr.? As it turned out, he was en route back to that very horror house, after having had to make an unplanned trip back to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. When his father put up a fight for his life, Joel Michael had sustained some injuries to his hands during the struggle, including a particularly nasty cut to his left thumb. He had first attempted to treat the wound by picking up some bandages and ointment at the very same Walmart his mother had done her grocery run shortly before he murdered her. It was optimistic of Joel Michael to think that would do much for a cut that deep. He must have tried his very best to bear through it while he raced against the clock to execute his post-murder cleanup. But as the hours dragged on and things kept going wrong and those bodies just refused to evaporate, the throbbing would have gone deeper and deeper until the pain was so invasive he just couldn't take it anymore. So some 24 hours and change into his abysmal cleanup effort, off to Louisiana he ran, where he received treatment at the State University's Student Health Center on the evening of Sunday, November 27th. He told them he fell down some stairs. When he returned back to the family home to see the police cordon the following Monday, he quickly realized he would not be returning inside. So he fled back to Baton Rouge yet again, where he was brazen enough to hide out at his own apartment. Though to be fair, it's not as if the little shit had anywhere else to go. That's where a lifetime of not making any friends gets you. For a time, he might have even thought he could have gotten away with it too, as police decided to monitor him for a day before executing an arrest warrant on Tuesday the 29th. He placed one phone call from prison to his roommate Michael McCracken, that one solitary friend from high school. Though when listening to the language in that call, one does wonder if, in Joel Michael's head at least, they were really just friends. I, uh, I, I don't really have much of a chance of being happy anymore, but you do. And I don't really know what to do about it. Um, eventually you're going to meet somebody, and you, you claim that I haven't been an albatross or anything before, but I certainly would be now. Prosecutors would argue that this was an instance of Joel Michael confessing on tape, while the defense contended what he was really doing was vocalizing the sorts of things he thought may have been going through Mr. McCracken's mind given how terrible everything looked, and that the latter interpretation was to be favored especially in light of this denial that came a short time later. It hurts my heart. You have been my best friend for my entire adult life. I don't know that that would ever have changed regardless of what you did. Um, this is the one very narrow area of the case where we actually side with the defense. One thing that's clear from the call is that Joel Michael obviously thinks the world of Mr. McCracken, and no one ever wants to admit to someone they love that they're an irredeemable monster. Um, I mean, I'm not fully surprised. All of that aside, I am angry and lost and confused and disappointed and upset and mourning you like you're dead even though I'm talking to you on the phone and I don't. It's taking everything I have to process and maintain my sanity. I mean, that is, that is the biggest thing here is that I think of you all the time. Thing on 
It is sort of interesting whenever you get a glimpse of a pure emotion like human affection in a person as vile as Joel Guy Jr., but his would otherwise be touching goodbye to Mr. McCracken was not going to be the beginning of any sort of redemption arc. He pled not guilty, of course, putting the rest of his family, let's just say Joel Sr. and Lisa's family, through more unnecessary anguish while the state put the mountain of evidence together to present their absolutely insurmountable case. The trial was finally ready to begin in late September of 2020, near the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. And on the whole, the four days of proceedings were remarkably boring given the sensational nature of the crimes at the centre of them, a testament to the efficacy of Tennessee's court system. The most striking feature of it wasn't any given witness or exhibit, but rather the consistently emotionless demeanour of Joel Guy Jr. True to that pervasive strangeness of his, he opted for one of those weird plastic face shield things instead of the more commonly preferred surgical or cloth mask. Maybe he didn't want to deny jurors the sight of his pretty face, but all it really achieved was to further emphasize just how utterly remorseless he was. After the limbs of these people were removed, the killer placed them separately into two 45-gallon blue Sterlite containers. And then he covered them with a corrosive substance and left them there to liquefy into uh, some sort of diabolical stew of human remains. You know, it's about money. That sounds uh, so terrible to think that you could kill your mother and your father for money, but that's really pretty much what it all boils down to. Money, all mine. He had made calculations, he had thought about it. He, uh, he spent some time. I mean, it's sort of a, a meticulous account of his intentions. One of the sisters, I believe it was uh, Renee Charles testified, uh, one of the sisters of Joel Sr. testified that uh, she knew her brother uh, had plans, his intention for the future, he, he was gonna let his son know uh, during the Christmas holiday that, uh, that he was gonna be cut off financially. You just can bet that Lisa Guy, who was Mr. Uh, uh, Joel Guy Jr.'s uh, biggest fan, his enabler, his supporter, you know that she told him. She had to tell him in advance what, was, what he was in for, what was coming up for him. You know that happened. And he's not used to supporting himself. He's used to having the support and uh, care uh, from his mother primarily taking care of his needs, providing him with an apartment, with utilities, with a car, gas money, paying his bills, his tuition, paying for his books, paying for everything. He's used to having her pay for everything. And he wasn't about to let them cut him off. I want you to think about the last moments that Joel Guy Sr. spent on this earth. He was attacked by his own son. He had to fight him off, and it was a fierce fight. At some point, that man had his hands on the knife that his son was using to kill him. And he knew it was his son. He faced him. Think about that. Think about the thrashing about It's no surprise that the defendant was hurt, and he must have been feeling some pain when he had to kill his poor mother. There she was at Walmart at 1218. How tragic that your last moments on earth were at a Walmart, buying bacon and sausage and food to prepare a nice breakfast probably for your dear son who was home. There she was purchasing things to take care of her boy, getting him ice cream, watching her put on her jacket because it was cold. It's very heartbreaking, thinking about her pulling up to the driveway, to that garage. And she lugged all of those bags of groceries in by herself, and uh, something made her go upstairs. What was it? Did she hear? struggle 
between her son and her husband? Did she? Or did he call her? Did he tell her to come upstairs? Did he say, Mother, I'm hurt? We don't know. We'll never know. All we know is that when she got to the top of the stairs, there he was, and he had a knife, and he stabbed her, and she saw him. She was stabbed in the clavicle. She saw this boy, her only child. You heard the testimony about how much she loved him, how she worked only to support him, And he cut her up. He cut her up. And then he cut her clothes off her body. He cut off her jeans. He cut off her panties. He cut off her shirt. He cut off her bra. He took off her ring and he left it in the floor. He cut off her head. He cut off his mother's head. He cut off his father's clothes. He pulled his jeans down. He piled it all up beside him. He left his cigarettes, Joel Sr.'s cigarettes, bloody pack on top. It struck me as an act of contempt. You know, here's your smokes, Dad. He left their bodies to cool off, you know, because he was hurt, and he had to go take care of himself. Do you remember seeing Lisa's purse on that, it was the kitchen table, not the dining room table, and her wallet, he had had done that, okay? The police didn't do that, okay? He needed cash. Lisa Guy paid for the medical supplies that he bought to treat his hands that he hurt when he was killing his father. She paid for the drain cleaner she was dissolved in. She paid for the muriatic acid. She paid for the work lights that he thought he was going to need. She paid for the sledgehammer. She paid for the timers. She paid for the plastic sheeting. She paid for that garden hose. She paid for the small sprayer in the master bathroom. She paid for the big sprayer, the bleach sprayer that was left in the floor of the kitchen. She paid for those garbage bags. She paid for his socks. She paid for his red potato salad that he got when he was buying his medical supplies because he worked up an appetite after all of that and he was in the mood for some red potato salad. Think about that. She paid for the tubs that she and her husband disintegrated in. She worked all those years at Jacob Engineering to put him up. And you know what, ladies and gentlemen? She was still looking for a job in Sergoinsville. She wasn't going to cut him off. She was going to find a job up there. She was going to keep supporting him. He was found guilty and sentenced to life, in case you were wondering, leaving nothing but unearned possessions and a devastated family behind him. The story of Joel Guy Jr. is the sort of thing that might make some people afraid of having children. It would be an extremely irrational fear statistically, of course. But still, what if? Imagine having a baby, and all the joy that comes along with that, and then as it starts to grow and form a personality, it begins to become apparent that it's... weird. Not disabled, either intellectually or physically in any way that's recognised, and not weird as in quirky, but more like just an emotionless ghoul, bereft of any apparent capacity for affection or desire to form interpersonal bonds. No real passions, no endearing personality traits, just laziness on top of selfishness, on top of let's face it ugliness and probably horrible B.O. And everyone else notices it's weird, How could they not? But you keep ignoring that, because it's your son. And so you love him, and you support him, until one day you can't anymore, and so he kills you for it. And desecrates your body. Not because of any disease, not because of any mistakes you made, but purely because sometimes they just come out wrong.